Stella, we would like to start with you, if that's okay. And uh, if, if it is agreeable to you, we would like to have 15 minutes of talk and then 15 minutes of questions and answers. But this depends how you would like to run it, of course. Um, and then Ozan will join us for, for his, his talk and then Patricia will join us. Um, and uh, in the meantime, if you would like to, um, participants, colleagues, if you would like to uh, put questions in the chat, we will try to manage them after the talks. But I'd like to hand it over to uh, an eminent scholar, um, um, gender management and critical management scholar to uh, Professor Stella Mukoma for his talk on doing research that matters. Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Mina. Uh, thank you, everyone. I am really, I am really honored to be asked to be part of the URAM Doctoral Consortium. I think things like this are so important for supporting our next generation of scholars who are gonna make wonderful contributions to knowledge and also changing the world. I am also delighted to be in good company with Patricia, who I've known for years, and Azan. So thank you for letting me start off, Mina. Uh, it's interesting that you've already talked about the idea of a doctoral studies being a journey. And uh, I, I think what I want to do is to tell, tell everyone, uh, to the doctoral students, I want to tell you about my journey and how I came to doing research that matters. So bear with me and then I can uh, extract out some lessons on that. But I thought, let, let, me tell, let me tell the journey. So when I completed my doctoral studies many years ago, <laughs> I thought I was a scholar. I was well-trained. I had produced a thesis that resulted in two journal articles in high quality journals, but I had to delude myself by quieting the voice inside of me that reminded me otherwise. When I became a doctoral student at the University of Massachusetts, I won't say when, but a long time ago, I was the first African-American woman ever admitted to the program in the School of Management. Like many other African-Americans at the time, it was always that way because we were historically excluded uh, from many spaces. I had worked in corporate America. And so coming into the doctoral program, also being a solo was not necessarily a novel experience. Uh, so when I, completed, when I completed my degree, I learned that although I had been admitted to the program, I had not been expected to make it. I indeed had been a gamble. I had entered the program and I wanted to study the career experiences of African-Americans in corporate America, or what the great black sociologist W.E. Du Bois captured so eloquently in the opening of his book, Souls of Black Folks. What does it mean to be seen as a problem? My experiences in corporate America, the experience of my friends and families were not ones of affirmation. They were ones of marginalization, inequality, and invisibility. And so when I got into the doctoral program, I could see that those experiences were virtually absent in the management and organization studies literature at the time. I was told bluntly that the topic I wanted to do for my thesis was not suitable for a doctorate. I was told to find a mainstream topic that would make a significant contribution to the field if I expected to get my degree. I realized it was an act of epistemic violence, silencing the topic of race and actually shackling, preventing me from bringing the subject into the academy. You know, it's really funny now you know, as a doctoral student, you're so focused on your thesis that you think this is going to be your academic career work. 
When I look at my thesis now, I cannot believe that I produced that thesis. It's actually remarkable. So it is a journey. So my thesis is very far from whom I have become as a scholar. So how did I find my voice as a scholar? Because the message I received during my doctoral studies was to pursue safe topics. Topics that would guarantee me uh, tenure, that would guarantee me a good job at a, at a great university in the US. I'm not sure that that message has totally changed. But my career experience is actually the contrary. What got me tenure was not the mainstream functionless research prescribed as the hegemonic mode of doing impactful research. Instead, it came when I embraced what I really believe was important. And I hope that'll be the message you'll take away from my talk. Let me tell you about the turning point of truly finding my scholarly voice. I remember it as if it happened yesterday. I had luckily met Taylor Cox Jr., who also did some outstanding work in the field of di diversity when I started my first academic position. Taylor was a few years ahead of me in his academic career, and he had a similar interest in people of color in corporate America. And so we embarked upon a research study to examine the career experiences of black MBA graduates. The completed surveys came to me. And along with one completed survey, one of the respondents had included a three page handwritten letter that was signed anonymous and in pain. I still have that letter today. The writer, a black woman, had written a rather detailed story of what it was like to be the only black woman manager in a division of a well-known Fortune 500 company. She shared, she shared stories of being devalued, labeled as incompetent, as well as incidents of everyday racism and sexism because of her race and gender. She wondered if she could withstand the isolation and rejection and ended the letter with these words. Thank you for doing this research and for reading this letter. I'm trying my best to survive this and remain whole, but right now it is extremely difficult. Her pain was real, but her organizational experiences were invisible and silent in management and studies organization, a knowledge. I had no way of contacting her. We had promised respondents anonymity, which is very important in doing rigorous research. And she had not revealed her identity. And that day I made a commitment in my diary. I wrote, I am on an agenda that I cannot escape until it is finished. My commitment from that moment was on, was to use my research skills and knowledge to give visibility to experience of people of color by raising my scholarly voice to make a difference. I chose to write about what had been silenced, marginalized, omitted, and I wanted to advocate for social justice and equality in the workplace. You know, it always bothers me in research studies that we talk about our subjects. And I think one of the, the, the realities of that letter is that these are people, these are people's lives. These are, they're, they're facing the consequences. Many of my well-meaning colleagues at my first job warned me that I was jeopardize, jeopardizing my academic career by focusing my research on race and other categories of marginalization. But their voices, their attempts to divert me from this commitment eclipsed 
the call for help in the letter I had received. I wasn't worried about tenure when I set upon this path. Instead, I was more worried about the enormous responsibilities that come with speaking for others and wanting to make sure that I did not represent, misrepresent their realities. It was much more about my personal experience. It was much more than about my personal experience. It was an exclusion, an exclusion that had consequences for so many black women and other people of color in corporate America. I decided to challenge the status quo of what constituted appropriate management knowledge. I started writing about these questions. I wrote one article with Taylor Cox, Invisible Men and Women, a status report on race as a variable in organization behavior research. And then I wrote in 1992, a paper that pointed to the denial that the Academy had about the importance of race. The emperor has no clothes, rewriting race in the study of organizations, which was published in the Academy of Management Review. I wrote the article in the first person because I was not pointing fingers at others, but I was also challenging myself to stay the course of being a voice for talking about race and racism in organizations. It was a very uncomfortable topic. And many voices would ask me things like, Stella, why are you placing yourself in an area that will not get you tenure? Why are you putting yourself in a ghetto? I had to convince a skeptical editor at the Academy of Radish Review at the time that I had to write the article in the first person he wanted me to write it in a distant objective voice. Luckily, I was able to convince him why I had to use we. From that point on, it was very clear to me what my voice was and how it could be used to make a difference. I'm humbled when young scholars tell me that some of my work inspired their research on race and gender. And I try to impress upon my doctoral students that becoming a scholar is not about being a technocrat armed with a toolbox of research skills to embark upon what Alveson and Sandberg referred to as incremental gap finding expeditions. Instead, the quest is about using one's research skills to make a difference in people's work lives creating better organizations, and in the end, making a contribution to a better world. My career has been built from the outside in, and it has allowed me to have a thriving career. I would not want to do it over any other way. Scholarship for me has never been about journal hits and citations. My compass remains doing research that makes a difference, advocating for social change and social justice. And I believe this pursuit has inspired me to do my very best work. So that's my story. And Mina, if I have a few more minutes, uh, I just wanted to point to a few lessons. Uh, say, no, we, are, uh, we, are, we are listening to you. Just speechlessly taking. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I, I want to share a few slides to, to extract out uh, uh, extract out a few uh, lessons from that because everybody's journey is personal. So your journey will not necessarily follow my journey. So if I could, do I have access to share the screen? Oh, let's see. Oh, here we go. I just want to. Uh, uh, Thank you. Can everybody see that? Yes, thank you. And so, let me just see if it's on slideshow. Okay, here we go. 
So I've already shared my journey. So I think what I would say to doctoral students, finding your scholarly voice, what do I mean by that? Okay. I'm not saying you have to have my voice. It has, and I like the word voice because everyone has a unique voice. And it was spoken about earlier. Where can you speak authoritatively? And finding one's scholarly voice means claiming, claiming, declaring, deciding an area of curiosity that you care about and matters to others. It also requires that you adopt an epistemological stance. What is your definition of truth? Okay. At, the at the University of Massachusetts, I was trained, I was told that you will do positivist <laughs> research. And we were, we were drilled all of the quantitative skills. But after I got that letter, I realized that no survey could ever capture that lived experience. And so truth for me could only be required by talking to my subjects by really understanding how they constructed the world. So one has to decide what is your definition of truth? What do you need to see to understand your phenomenon? And of course, you have to acquire the methodological tools and skills to produce the high quality research. So I would ask you to reflect upon these areas. Who am I? I think a lot about what we end up choosing to study is often based on who we are, our experiences or our observations. How does my identity inform the kinds of questions or problems I wish to pursue? What inspires me to do the intellectual work I'm pursuing? I always ask my doctoral students when they come to me with their topics, I always ask them, which they take, they, they get a little bit unnerved. I always ask them, why do you want an answer to that question? Why is that question important to you? Where did that question come from? Uh, B, who cares about my research question? Who cares? Why are they important and for whom? If I get an answer to this question, what problem or who will be affected by it? And, and C is very important because I tell you, there was a lot of resistance uh, from my supervisors, from my new, new people in my faculty when I got my first job. Do I have the courage and conviction to resist what, I call, what, what Alveson calls identity regulation? Where are you supposed to publish in certain journals? You're supposed to do mainstream topics? You're supposed, supposed to be objective and not political. So these are things that you must reflect upon, I think. And then, so what are the practices of doing research that matters that I can share with you that help me to do this work? And some of these were already mentioned this morning. Finding your scholarly community, uh, or you can say finding your tribe. But I think if you're going to be asking critical questions and sociological questions, political questions, I would think it's important also to go across disciplinary boundaries. To reach if your work is touching, like my work touches on areas like post-colonial studies, critical theory, uh, feminism. So I have a network of scholars from many disciplines that I work with. So reading outside of your discipline, in fact, when I'll just tell you a funny story, when I was at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, we had one of the top radical economics departments in the world. And we were told as doctoral students, don't go over there because those people teach radical economics. And so of course I went and took a course there <laughs> and it, it, you know, got to read Braverman's book, which was an eye opener. The other thing is collaboration. Collaboration, find people to collaborate with from that scholarly community. Challenging the status quo and speaking truth to power. 
If you read my work, I'm always in a challenging mode. I don't take for granted what has already been said. And that can be a powerful way of making social change. And in order to do that, you still have to do rigorous research, but it's not a trade-off. So strive for rigor and making a difference. Because indeed, if you are, if you're speaking truth to power, your work is going to be more scrutinized. You know, the first time I presented some of my research after I had finished my doctorate at the Academy of Management, I tell you, I, the questioning was more than your typical questions. It was scrutinizing the research and, and journal editors and reviewers, you know, will question your findings. Engage with the real world and use research to advocate for societal change, intellectual activism. Engage with the real world, you know, be part of what is going on out there to understand what you're studying. And so I do a lot of uh, participation in community groups here in South Africa. I was very fortunate. I got to work with the president's office on the status of women. And so that gives you a greater understanding of the phenomenon that you are studying or trying to research. And last of all, exert agency in how you shape your career, take risk. Meaning don't follow the given path. You should think carefully about where you take your first positions what you decide to do. And, you know, I knew with the kind of work that I wanted to do, when I went for my job interviews, I could tell at the job interviews, I dare not go to that school and take a job because it will be a repetition of the resistance that I found in my doctoral students' studies. So let me just, uh, pull from an article, which I think it's an article worth reading. I assign it to my doctoral students by Alvison and Sandberg. Has management studies lost its way? The ideas for more imaginative and innovative research. Two of the points they make is that if your, your research can be rigorous, but it could in, end up not being in, interesting or influential, it must challenge an audience taken for granted assumptions. And the second point they make, which I already made, that we need less instrumental gap spot spotting scholars and more researchers with a broader outlook, who are curious, who are reflective, who are willing and able to question your own frameworks and not to swallow them whole without thinking about what am I producing? Who am I empowering? Who benefits? I'm almost done. And I want to end with this quote from Elisa Cantu. We are, knowledge is never neutral, although we're taught that it can be objective, but knowledge is not neutral. We're all, we are always already involved in the ontological reproduction of the world. It's mattering. Thus, we have to take a stand on what kind of subjects we are and what kind of world we want. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope I've been a contribution to your thinking. And I've just put the citation of this article written by Kantu. And uh, she also talks about making a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. Thank you, Stella, for this fascinating, fascinating talk and so inspiring, so insightful. Um, I have taken many notes and I have learned a lot. Thank you so much. And I, and I'm, and I can see in the chat that our uh, DC participants have also been uh, engaging well with, the, with the talk. And we have a number of questions, if I may take them, Stella, if that's OK with you. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Shushant Bargava. 
Um, the first, she, uh, we had two questions. The first question is, how have your views on impact evolved over the years? And how should I work to influence my voice with my personal experiences you have? Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, you know, impact, well, I've written about that too. I think that part of the problem is who, who do you want to impact? You see, so for me, my, my views have changed in the big, it, it's not just the, article, the journal article and what journal you have it in, but you have to be pragmatic because the systems are set up in such a way that if you want to have a permanent position, you have to meet certain criteria. But that does not preclude you from writing and publishing about something that matters. The good news is that many journals are open to it and they're high quality journals. So, it, so that's not a trade-off anymore. But my, my impact has evolved to the point that I want to see change in the broader society. So I strive for impact by trying to uh, take what I learned from research and sharing it with relevant communities that can use it. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of two things, you know, I said in South Africa, I've done some work here because, you know, South Africa, the big agenda is transformation. So I've worked on projects like gender mainstreaming and doing workshops and community groups. The other thing is to, the other thing that my colleague Ellen Bell and I did realizing how women of color struggle with the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, challenges in, 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 in their organizations. We, we did a women's leadership program. So I, I think you have to have almost a dual track when I think about it on impact. But I do, tr I do aim for the top journals because I want, <laughs> I want to challenge the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I don't always get into them, but I think uh, we have to talk to them, you know? But there's high quality journals. The good news is there's many high quality journals uh, today where one can have options on where one publishes. And what was the second aspect of the question? I'm sorry. Uh, how, how should I work to infuse my voice, my views, with my personal experiences into research? Well, you can. I mean, first of all, by the topics you study and, and the choices you make. So for example, you know, I was interested in the intersection of race and gender. So I, my colleague Ella Bell and I did a project on our, we, call, we wrote a book about it, Our Separate Ways, Black and White Women in Corporate America. The other thing you can do is to use your own story sometimes to uh, design research or to write about that. So I think that you can do that. You, you, there are many ways that you can do it. I hope that answers your questions. Thank you so much, Sela, it does indeed. There is one more question um, from Anna. Anna is asking, has your ontology epistemology remained constant in last decades or is it constantly evolving? Do our epistemologies okay. evolve as well? Yeah, it, it's constantly evolving because knowledge is dynamic. You know, I, I, was looking at, I was looking at the Emperor Has No Clothes paper actually, which I wrote in 1992. And, and the alternative uh, modes of knowledge, knowledge and theories that I put there, I realized, wow. <laughs> I even said to myself, they're quite timid for the issue of race. And so it has evolved. So now um, I'm looking more at uh, post-colonial studies, some of the newer critical theories that are gaining prominence. So yes, that's another, I'm glad, I'm glad that was asked. You need to keep up. <laughs> you know, so people are talking about decolonization, and then I look at that and see how does that inform my, my questions. And so I, I tell my doctoral students, I don't mind if a doctoral student comes with me with a huge, with a huge research question, because I think you do need a grand question, because that question could guide you over time. And we shouldn't push them in the beginning to be so narrow. So I say, yes, think of your thesis perhaps as the first thing that you will do in terms of that grand, that grand challenge. But 
You're going to need something that pulls you, that sustains you. And so, you know, the questions of inequality and racism, those are big questions. And I find different ways to study them. So yes, my, 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 my thinking has evolved. And the other thing, I'm a big believer in this, read out, read across disciplines. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's always new knowledge and new frameworks that can allow you to look at your topic in a different lens which then allows you to ask new questions, do different research. Thank you so much, Stella, once again. Thank you so much for this really inspiring, amazing journey. Um, we are your followers. Thank you, Mina. Thank you so much. And all the best to all the doctoral students. You're gonna do well, you're gonna do fine. Thank you so much, thank you. Um, we have uh, my dear colleague Ozan Alakavutlar waiting for us in the room and uh, warm welcome to Ozan. Uh, Ozan uh, is an associate professor from Utrecht University, Netherlands. He is also a, 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 an activist, critical management and diversity scholar. I'd like to hand it over to Ozan for his keynote talk. Thank you so much, Ozan, for joining us and thank you so much for connecting with our doctoral candidates and colleagues in this DC. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mina, and all the colleagues. Uh, it's really an honor uh, to be part of this opening panel, uh, of course, uh, being alongside uh, with Stella and also Patricia. And also, of course, uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to learn also from doctoral students, hopefully, uh, through question and answer and also through reflections. Um, I also want to share my slides uh, that will also give some kind of uh, key uh, points. I guess you can see, right, my slides? Yeah, yes. all right, okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, thanks for the introduction, Mina. I just also want to uh, tell that um, this, this presentation is also to some, to some extent uh, how I found my voice uh, following what Stella said and um, how I came to uh, going on let's say uh, this journey um, working towards an activist academy it's, it's still a journey it is still also an attempt to find my voice and still also trying to make sense of my voice in a uh, in, in an, an academic community and uh, with this i would like to share my uh, uh, reflections on the nature of uh, the current uh, phase of university or the academy and have how uh, we can do things differently and I, what i try to do things differently um, I got my undergraduation and postgraduation degrees in Turkey uh, at Dokuzeli University, and then I got for my first post uh, in New Zealand as a lecturer uh, at Messi uh, Business School. Uh, and after living and working there for six years, I uh, moved back to Europe, and now I'm working at Utrecht University School of Governance. During my postgraduate studies, it was a really big question mark for me to, 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 to see the difference between what is told to us about the nature of management science or management studies and what I really want to do. Uh, and this, this disparency uh, helped me find, uh, to some extent, my voice in the field of critical management studies. And then, of course, uh, it evolved into a different uh, path, I would say. And this was this, this major uh, milestone was in New Zealand. And I also want to refer to that. I want to begin with a kind of hypothetical conversation between an academic activist and also the university as an institution. So the academic says, I want to change the world. And the university responds, you mean you want to improve your impact factor, right? Um, no, not really. I want to change the world, you know, help people. Keep talking. We can turn this into a publication. I think this is a really nice way of putting where we are at now. And also we can argue, keep talking. We can turn this into an impact, right? Uh, so this is not really different from what Marx said uh, around a hundred years ago. As academics, as philosophers, as those who, as intellectuals, uh, we, to some extent, we uh, interpreted the world in various ways, but the point, however, is to change it. Then how are we going to do it? And this is also, of course, one of the titles which Alessia uh, Conte used in uh, one, other, uh, one of other his, uh, her publication. And, 
um, I also kind of uh, in conversation with uh, her approach or with her uh, intervention, I would say. So uh, from this, how, how, how we can really think about an activist academy? How can we think about academy in a different form? What is the role of the university and management organizing states academics today? This is not a, again, a new debate. It has been around for a very long time, but just building on what Stella said, I think it is really important to ask this question, knowledge for whom and for what purpose, what we want to achieve with our, with, with, with our PhDs, with our <coughs> uh, studies. Our, uh, and um, it is not that easy, of course, because while we want to aim for a social change or while, while we want to uh, make a difference with our research, uh, it is. It takes place at a at a realm where we see multiple tensions, and we are really at the intersection of these multiple tensions. On one hand, there are funding regimes that determine the debates to some extent about rigor versus relevance versus impact. For instance, I can give a very uh, clear example from New Zealand that there is an, an exercise which is similar to the UK REF, Research Excellence Framework. There is a, a public-based uh, funding uh, exercise in uh, New Zealand. And it's all about, to some extent, to show that how you publish in well-ranked journals so that the, the university can get funds for maintaining this research. But then, of course, there is this question. You can publish in well-ranked journals. That's great that you contribute to knowledge, you, you develop theory, but this is also to some extent criticized whether we are really obsessed with developing theories uh, and we are kind of reiterating more or less around the same arguments, which is the argument coming from Dennis Turish uh, in his last book. Um, the question is also about how, what, what is your relevance and relevance for whom? Would you like to produce knowledge for the managers? Would you like to produce knowledge for organizations? Would you like to produce knowledge for the corporation, which is kind of the mainstream kind of uh, organizing form as we can criticize, uh, of course. And also um, what kind of impact you want to make and how you frame this impact. Is it framed in a more neoliberal way as uh, criticized in the literature or you really want to create difference or make difference through your research. So there are these tensions and in these tensions also we need to find our way, which puts us into a really interesting situation. Are we, are we becoming more schizophrenic here? They're trying to write grants at one hand, trying to write public uh, um, studies, uh, trying to engage with other stakeholders, including different groups of uh, communities. And then, of course, the, the argument came to the level that one size really does not fit, el, fit all. And we note that there are new attempts for new recognition and reward systems, and we need to navigate through these kind of new relations as, as researchers. And of course, I also need to mention that there's a huge political pressure right now on academic freedom and critical theories and curricula. Just think about the case in the University of Leicester School of Management. Just think about the current discussions in Denmark that how some particular ways of teaching are uh, blamed for being partisan, etc. cetera. Um, and we, we also note that right now that there is uh, the pandemic conditions are used as excuse for restructuring uh, the higher education, uh, again, with less people for maximum output, uh, again, also what kind of output is a question mark here, more publications, more impact, or what, what is it there um, is a question mark, uh, and also redundancies, and these are also taking place in Australia, in New Zealand, and in Canada. Just a very quick survey on, on the web, you will see lots of things going on in the universities right now along these tensions. So within, with, against this background, of course, it, how, however it may seem a bit grim, can we think about activist academy? That is what I have found my, where I have found my voice. And now I would like to see, despite these tensions, despite this kind of grim background, can we do meaningful act activist research? And again, this has been always with us. This discussion has been with us for a very long time as social scientists. But now, of course, we are feeling it much more because we see, uh, influential contradictions. We see the impact of grant challenges. And of course, we need kind of progressive social change. And again, going back to the question, what is our role here as uh, academics? Are we going to produce knowledge for the status quo or are we going to really challenge uh, the inequalities, challenge uh, the injustices? And 
this is uh, this discussion also takes place, of course, in critical management studies, or uh, has been taken in uh, CMS. But there are uh, it's, it's a, again a kind of long uh, debate. Um, how are we going to link the theory? I would argue that it's a kind of dialectical relationship that we can't separate theory and praxis. And this this uh, uh, doing activist research is a uh, great opportunity to engage with the grand challenges and also to see the validity of our critical theories to change the world. If we really want to change the world, if we really want to uh, make difference. Uh, you can refer to uh, some discussions about public CMS, uh, public organization management studies, which was very recently published by Anne Conliffe and uh, by Pavlovic. Uh, they particularly argue for a more engaged uh, public organization management studies. And also there's another uh, strand of discussion, which is of course related as just uh, Stella argued also, uh, ac how can we think about uh, activist academia? How can we think about activist research that would deal with social, economic and epistemic justices? So if we need some change, that's to some extent apparent given what we are living in the consequences after 2008 financial crisis, uh, just going through the uh, impact of pandemic conditions, the changing understanding of the work, the changing understanding of uh, social reproduction, the changing understanding of our economy. Given all these things, for and with whom we can work with, for, for, for whom we can produce knowledge, with whom we can work, together. And here, uh, after, of course, trying to find my voice, I would invite you uh, as PhD students, as researchers, to engage with activists, to engage with activist communities, to engage with social movements who are really tackling these challenges uh, at forefront. And there is no one way of doing these things. That's also very important to argue because um, that the, uh, as, as, as the current uh, university system pushes us into a particular way of doing science, particular way of doing um, uh, studies, I would argue there are also multiple ways of engaging with so, uh, societal challenges, uh, multiple ways of engaging with different communities. And th there are, these are just some uh, examples. You can be an advocate of social, economic, and epistemic justice within and outside academy. You can do critical research and you can also do teaching differently that may feed into activism. You can build new relations, new networks within and outside academy. I will give also some examples from my case. Um, you can learn from these communities. You can just go along with these communities because you can also see that these communities, grassroots organizations, social movements, they are all uh, living laboratories of social innovations and that you can actually see how their practices already changed the world, already changed the way we organize the economy, already changed the, uh, the, 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 the world already constructed. And you can think, for instance, I will engage first and then my, the research may follow. So there are multiple ways and I would say you will find your own voice just as uh, Stella said, or your, uh, your way, uh, you'll find your own way uh, just as Stella said. And then how I have I found my voice? I would like to give a very clear example here. When I was doing my field work in New Zealand, uh, this is a short uh, uh, um, uh, enlarged map, uh, Palms North City. You can see Messi University is a bit out, out at outsur outskirts of the city. There is a bridge just connecting the city with the, the university, and my field work was at the city center. And I was, work, I was doing a volunteer work. I was a participant observation for a community organization that was not particularly activist per se, but what they did was really important about the sustainability uh, of uh, food surplus, about sustainability of society. And when I was just working alongside with my, one, of, one other volunteers, with one of the colleagues there, she told me, you are not like others. Those who stay on the other side of the bridge, and do their jobs as academics. Of course, she's referring to the university there. You cross the bridge and come here and work with us. You are different. Of course, that was a bit kind of confrontational for me. What do you mean with difference? Really, am I different? Then I, it, it was a really triggering effect for me to think about my role. Of course, I was already involved in some discussions about the nature of critical management studies, critical theories, the need for praxis, the need to engage with grand challenges. And I, I particularly chose this way of doing field work in order to make myself more engaged with the communities and also with grand challenges. 
but this be, this this statement or this kind of feedback pre-fight what my voice should be about, what my work should be about. And then my whole question for uh, my research and for my uh, role as an academic turn into this question. Can we bring the university, and in my case, critical organization studies, the, 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 the discussions, the theories, the findings, to the communities who do things differently? And when I engage in this kind of questioning, and also during my fieldwork, I, I also encountered uh, different uh, literatures, different uh, framings, different theories, and one of them was very striking for me. Uh, Gibson Graham, uh, who are uh, feminist Marxists and also who are critical geographers, who argue that the economy is already quite diverse. You do not need to think in a kind of real monolithic one way of organizing the economy, uh, aka capitalism. Actually, through this diverse uh, perspective, we can think how we can organize society differently and through just dealing with these challenges, through just finding our way as local communities, we may, we may create uh, uh, differences, we may make the differences and we can come up with new innovative way of organizing economy, society, uh, uh, the world, uh, if you want to say. And with this kind of question, then this separation between research, teaching and service roles seemed really arbitrary to me. And I, be, I, I have been working on bridging my research, teaching and service roles uh, all the time. This was my practice in uh, New Zealand and I also try to do it in uh, my current uh, academic role. And um, simply I also want to work on, or I'm currently working on bridging academia and activism for knowledge and praxis generation. So it is not only knowledge, but also praxis. That's what I meant with going beyond uh, producing knowledge, going beyond uh, simply uh, publishing, but also engaging with real life, engaging with communities, and then contributing to the generation of praxis. Uh, just a couple of examples, then I'll uh, finish my presentation. Um, just with a real uh, small fund that I got from Mesa University at that time in 2014, I initiated a kind of seminar. In the beginning, it was very small. It was called Social Movements, Resistance and Social Change. 40 people attended. And given the uh, scale of New Zealand, um, it reached out uh, different groups and uh, policymakers, activists, um, uh, representatives, representatives of social movements, they all attended this small event. And this small event turned into a major uh, conference uh, that engage with uh, other, for instance, uh, activist journal initiatives, with other networks, with a, a kind of think tank. Of course, there was this background. It is not that this uh, conference created, but it kind of mobilized, a kind of facilit facilitated this kind of dialogue. And then it was uh, uh, organized in the, in, the, in the following years. In the classroom, I also try to align theory, pedagogy, and practice. I do not teach from a mainstream textbook, for instance. I use recently published journal articles who are really uh, touching upon the grand challenges so that I push students to think differently, uh, to, to, to uh, question the status quo. And then uh, with some news articles, with some uh, movies and other things, I really want them to practice what they have learned from the theory. And Currently, I'm involved in a kind of network building, which we call Anders Utrecht, that uh, aims to bring multiple grassroots organizations together so that we can have a long-term relationship. It is not that we go there and uh, just uh, collect data, gather, gather data. It is more like uh, building a kind of infrastructure where we can uh, co-produce knowledge, where we can uh, work together. And then, um, uh, another uh, important uh, part of bridging academia and activism. Uh, very recently, uh, we developed a new master's program uh, at School of Governance as a, uh, as a collective, I would say, as, as chair of organization studies, uh, which also perhaps uh, is only involved uh, as a chair. And um, it was just uh, approved by the university. And it, the, the whole narrative is around interviewing theory, pedagogy, and praxis. 
that that will also build, for instance, uh, build on the network that we uh, created with Anders Utrecht, that the students will come, they will have theoretical classes, but beginning from hopefully from the uh, initial period or be beginning period, they will have some roles in different organizations. Uh, they will bring cases from organizations to the class and we will discuss them. The, they will also take the theories into the praxis. And in addition to that, I, I, I really find this very important. Sometimes it is not recognized. Sometimes uh, it, it is not counted as a part of your uh, work. But I really find importance uh, in service roles. These are, these are real critical roles to nourish, support, and build critical activist communities, collective, collectives within the academy. Uh, so that you can actually share, you have your tribe around yourself, you, you build your tribe, you uh, become uh, part of like-minded scholars, like-minded activists, like-minded colleagues, so that you try to do things together. It's not an individual effort at all. It's all about building uh, an academy uh, for social change. And of course, it is it is, it is a kind of ongoing uh, navigation between institutional requirements, as just Stella also said, or finding your way, finding your voice, uh, sometimes compromises, sometimes pushing the agenda. Uh, but this is a collective process. You can't do it by yourself. It's not an individual effort. And these are the things that inspired me. And I just hope that you, all, you also get inspired you, uh, with, this, with this presentation, with some examples. And I kindly invite you to work together to build the Activist Academy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ozan. Thank you. Another very inspiring, another very insightful um, talk on this really, really important topic, Ozan, and um, so many interesting insights that we have gathered. Um, that we have, that there is also a communication going on in the chat, and there is there is a question um, uh, from one of our uh, participants that I'd like to start with that, if that's okay with you, Ozan. And then please, by all means, uh, colleagues, uh, participants, please, please do 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 ask further questions. Um, this is a question from Sushan Bargava. I feel in the light of Stella's experiences that it is as dangerous as it is exhilarating. To, 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 to even want to change the world or the world view? What are your views? Good question. I think I, with my presentation, I already make it quite explicit that it might be dangerous, but these are the choices. Either you stick with your passion, uh, with what you want to do, uh, despite the challenges, tensions, and uh, or you feel oh. quite uh, alienated with what you are supposed to do. Uh, within the institutional regimes. I, 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 do, I do not have a particular answer about the danger of things, uh, given the, for instance, case in, in, in Leicester, which is really frustrating, mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, for instance, Gibson Burrell, who is like a god in our field, I would say, who is an amazing scholar, just because of uh, his kind of worldviews, who is also a really kind of uh, one of the main contribut contributors to organization theory, uh, he lost his job. Of course, it's, there's a, a, a process going on, I guess, there about with legal aspects, uh, etc. But my point is, you just follow the passion. Mm. And this is what I did. That, 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 that passion took me to New Zealand, and that passion brought me to the Netherlands. Of course, there are some other things, but work-wise, these are the things, the ability, the, 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 the enabling conditions that you do scholarship as how you wish. And then, as I said, you try to nourish uh, your community so that you, you feel that you are not al alone and you are part of a larger community. That's very important. Despite all the pressure that this neoliberal university wants us to individualize, we should resist that. Writing in collectives, for instance, mm -hmm. using collective names, these are not easy things. These are challenges and might, might be really difficult uh, even uh, when you are dealing with a PhD. Mm -hmm. But I think this is how I see scholarship. I, th again, I, 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 it is very difficult for me to separate uh, research, teaching, and service roles. They all complement. And you just, uh, yeah, you just try to manage all these tensions. 
That's great. I mean, I, I was just thinking as you were talking, Ozan, that your passion took you to New Zealand and then to Netherlands. And I'm just thinking that I'm so glad that passion took us to you to connect with the URAM DC today. So it was it was an amazing talk. It really, really was. I, I, I will read and learn more about it, definitely. There is another question, which is a very good question in my view, from Louise Lecomte. Uh, Louise is asking, do you consider that an activist research has to necessarily be affiliated to crit critical management studies research, CMS research? No, no, CMS, this is, a, this is also a kind of long discussion, I would say, but I would embrace a long tradition of critical theories. It doesn't have to be associated with CMS. Since we are part of, uh, part of management and organization studies, it is a particular group who is bringing these kind of discussions into the management and organization studies. But when you look at the history of social sciences, even referring back to Marx and the way we interpret and need to change the world, it is always uh, at the core of the tension in social sciences. So you do not need to be affiliated, of course, with uh, CMS, but it would give you some insights about the nature of management sciences, about uh, the power relations, about the claims on uh, objectivity and how we should understand uh, management and organization studies, etc. I hope that was a helpful response. Yes, very, very helpful. Very helpful in this, Ozan. There are two more questions, Ozan, but I'm conscious of the time. Sure. And one of the questions is a question to, for all of the keynote speakers. So we could, if you like, wait for Patricia to uh, talk after, and we can we can address that together, if you like, in Stella, yourself, and Patricia. Um, so I'd like to thank you again so much uh, for joining us with all the passion, with all the insights, with all the experiences that you brought to you brought to us today, to our screens. Thank you so much, Ozan. I'm really grateful. Thank you very My much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank for you very much, Ozan. Um, thanks again. Patricia, um, I, I'd like to, uh, Professor Patricia Zanoni is with us, uh, another great uh, diversity scholar, another uh, person who is passionately advocating this line of work. Uh, I would like to ask Patricia, would you, would you like us to have a, a five minutes comfort break before before we continue with yours. I mean, how would the audience feel about it? Shall we just have uh, maximum five minutes though? We need to be back at 10 to 35, everyone, okay? Just That's a, a great minutes. idea, Mina. Thank yeah. you so much, Patricia. Thanks a lot. We'll, we'll connect back again, I mean, at uh, 35 past, okay? Thank you so much, Patricia. Are we back? Okay. Great, great. Everyone is back. Um, I am delighted to introduce uh, another great colleague of mine, ours, uh, who is Professor Patricia Patricia Zanoni um, from Hasselt University, Belgium, and uh, he is a, a great diverse scholar. He is going to. He is. He's, he's one of our keynote speakers today, and he's. Go she is going to talk about the performativity. Uh, in the context of activist relevant research. Thank you so much, Patricia. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mine, uh, for having me. And it was, it has been great to, to be invited also uh, uh, this, to this um, uh, PhD consortium or uh, seminar before uh, the conference. I must admit, um, I don't know Urim uh, very much, but I'm very happy uh, to address this audience today and also with uh, my colleagues and friends, uh, Stella Ozam, uh, who I know uh, well and with whom I've worked in the past um, and I'm uh, still working today. So um, I'm Patrizia and I'm uh, a critical diversity scholar. That's how I define myself. And uh, so the critical is the link to Ozan and the diversity is the link to Stella and, and both. <laughs> and um, I, it, com, speaking third, it like puts me in the difficult uh, situation of not having to rehearse <laughs> many of, there are so many overlaps, but that's actually a good thing. It means that the conversation is joined and we can move forward uh, together. Now, I would like to emphasize that we are in a very specific moment in history of at the time of really interrogation of the societies we are in. Um, there, you know, if you look around your, 
if we look around ourselves, we see a lot of conflict, an upsurge in conflict in society it becomes much more visible. We name it, it's uh, in the media, in, the, in social media, right? Uh, these conflicts are very salient. You, you know, the, the issues have been already touched upon, um, like uh, institutionalized racism, for example, but also patriarchy. Uh, think about the climate crisis. Uh, the you know the the changing relations between uh, the global south and the global north, for example, and of course uh, the pandemic we have been uh, in for the past year and a half have uh, has pointed to us uh, to the shortcomings of the way we organize the economy and societies, and so in that sense, being a PhD student today, I feel is very different uh, than being a PhD student like 20 years ago. I will say Stella, <laughs> when, when I was a PhD student, which is the, you know at the end of this century, uh, seems like yesterday, but it's not actually. Um, but if I started a PhD today, it could not be the same PhD as a PhD starting in 2001, just because these issues which when I started were very much at the background where my specific choice, where you know, my personal commitment due to my personal trajectory are now so much out there that you know, part, part of it is of course the struggle that many have fought to put them up there, right? But, um, in a sense, because they are so much visible and uh, we can name them, and, and I wouldn't say legitimate, but a legitimate object of study, it is more uh, feasible and easy, I think, to uh, do research on uh, these issues. So as a critical scholar who was critical before critical <laughs> was a necessity and, uh, you know, critical in the sense, you know, being aware that we need to do scholarship that is more explicitly uh, transformational, that must more explicitly needs to address the question that how we have been doing things in organizations, in our economies up to now is not a feasible path for the future. Um, so I think this is, as a critical scholar today, you know, I had to defend myself at my VIVA, my PhD defense, the most difficult question or the most, I would say, <laughs> mean question was not on the content of what I was doing, was not on the theories uh, that I had been using. It was about why do you brand yourself as critical? You know, <laughs> and I said, you know, because I want to, basically. <laughs> and, you know, that was the kind of conversation. I don't think the conversation would be the same today uh, because there, mu there is much more awareness about, you know, the need to unpack, the need to uh, interrogate assumptions in what we do as management and organizational scholars. And so for me, as an early day critical scholar, the question is, you know, what is the role of critical scholarship today at a historical moment where everybody uh, is moving towards being a bit more uh, critical? Well, you must know that uh, in the past decade, within the critical community, which I uh, I will not call CMS, although I have less of a problem of, uh, with the label critical management studies, because I always in, I've always interpreted this label as a very loose label, you know, not as a, uh, anything uh, dogmatic or anything, but more of a community, a tribe of people that more explicitly refer to, to critical theory. But within this community, there has been a, a debate going on on performativity. And performativity is a difficult word, actually referring to the ability to foster uh, social change. And a, a decade ago, like in 2012, a first article appeared um, 
saying that uh, you know critical management studies had been unable to um, to foster change basically because it had been too much uh, uh, busy with developing critique of organizations and management. And uh, since then, a whole conversation has uh, you know, gone on and uh, developed. And um, I was always uh, very, very upset about this whole debate, uh, not understanding what the debate is actually about, but also because I've tried to do critical management studies in a different way than what is proposed in this debate. So this debate um, basically took the idea that is very core to critical management studies that you don't conduct management scholarship to help management achieve managerial goals. This is not your role as a scholar. You know, it can be that the knowledge you produce can help uh, organizations do things better, of course, but you don't subordinate all your research to the question of optim optimization of processes, of you know, enhancing profitability, enhancing performance. Mm -hmm. um, so the, this uh, very foundational idea of critical man management studies is that it's a non, it's a non-functionalistic stand. So you're not a means to achieve a higher goal. You are an independent scholar and you carry out scholarship, you know, uh, that is not necessarily, uh, yeah, subordinate to management. And, the, and this idea um, in, in this debate of, of critique about the non-performativity of, of CMS, the, it, it produces an idea of the scholar, the critical scholar, as a, actually as a male, generally male, white Anglo-Saxon slash Scandinavian guy who basically fills the profession of being a scholar by publishing critique in highly repu reputable journals. And this idea, this, this production of our uh, profession ha has never really resonated with what I'm, who I am social demographically, but also what I do <laughs> in my job every day. Um, so this whole debate is about, you know, producing a scholar that actually I think is not really the, uh, the embodiment of the critical scholar in order to critique a stance which is not the stance that most of us take. And in order, and this is perhaps the most appalling part of it, to call for engaging more with managers, <laughs> you know, you know to, uh, a call for uh, being less busy with uh, developing critique uh, of organizations and uh, entering more relationships with managers. And reading this, uh, this kind of articles and these uh, interactions, uh, I was like, I, it, for me, it felt really uh, a, a strange, I had a strange sense of not recognizing myself within this community uh, and these practices. What is wrong with this narrative? The first thing is that our, our everyday practice as critical scholar is not one of uh, solely focusing on developing critique in order to publish articles. Secondly, <laughs> I hear some echo. Second, sorry, I think somebody has a mic on. Yes, okay. Um, the second point is, is that the our ability to have an impact rests on a collective practice, not a, an individual practice. And third, and I will explain these three points, um, a cornerstone, a cornerstone of critical scholarships is engagement with multiple stakeholders, not only with managers. And this is not even uh, something that only critical management studies uh, think. It's something that has, is quite embedded in uh, management scholarship. You know, think about CSR and stakeholder theory, which are not even cri particularly critical uh, theories, right? Um, 
So our practice is a heterogeneous one. To give you an idea, as a critical scholar, I today uh, am, you know, engage in many practices where I try to uphold accountability relationship to my peers um, that are in line with the principle of a scholarship that interrogates the assumptions of organizations that it is committed to redressing inequalities um, and that tries to enact it in every practice. And these practices range from, you know, the type of education, as Ozan mentioned, that we try to uh, engage with, with our students. But it's also more mundanely in processes of recruitment and evaluation of personnel in, in my teams. Uh, it's uh, in developing policies within the university to make sure that people are not disadvantaged because the criteria that are used for evaluations and promotions are skewed towards advantaging some groups. Uh, it has to do with you know, uh, curating journals where uh, scholarship that opens up the economy, opens up organization is welcomed and makes a chance to be published and therefore also makes a chance that people that make more difficult or less you know, taken for granted choices, that, uh, um, that they get a chance to publish their work in order to you know, be able to be scholars and stay within academia. So critical praxis is a practice, a praxis that is very diverse. It starts with awareness of theory and uh, to a certain extent also theory that is not the classical theory that you would find, you know, uh, the, the mainstream classical theory that you would only find within organization studies, like breaking up the uh, disciplinary boundaries, questioning, uh, questioning the assumptions that we take often uh, for granted of uh, in how we do things. It starts there, but it's not, not only that, it's a lot of practices to create the tribe. And the tribe has been mentioned a few times. To, in order to create the tribe, um, to cure the tribe, to nurture the tribe, you need to do many things. Um, that go beyond the published articles. For example, you know, this, this place, this conversation, curating this conversation is, a, uh, is an example of this, right? So our practice is heterogeneous. Also very importantly, and I think this is perhaps the even more uh, fundamental, this idea that in order to make a change, you need to move as a collective. It's not only, I mean, you need to, to find your own voice. And I think, especially in the beginning as a PhD student, uh, looking for your own voice is a very crucial part of the job, right? Of being a scholar. But never forget that uh, none of what we achieve uh, in terms of changing, in terms of having impacts, can be there without somebody around you, a collective around you that moves you, that supports you, and that you yourself support as well. I think we are disciplined and, and uh, socialized very strongly, not only, uh, you know, starting from school, but not only in school, to think of ourselves as individuals, individual projects. I have a career, I have even the metaphor of voice, which is an import, important metaphor and one which I uh, would uh, certainly personally, you know, um, support, kind of gives this idea that we are individuals, uh, uh, that we are not part of something bigger. And I think this is a great limitation uh, today because we grow up with such an idea of me, me accountable, me, uh, you know, uh, who has to perform, me who has to have an, an, a known idea without uh, having a language to name 
the fact that the me is never just a me, is a me because you are you, is a me because uh, within a group, you have a practice, you have goals, you have a mission, you have long-term uh, goals. And of course, this uh, idea that, I mean, this collective means also an ethical responsibility towards the others, right? Uh, of, you know, of sharing, of supporting, of being solidary, something that is very hard to uphold because at the end of the day, we're also evaluated as individuals and not as groups. So it also uh, puts us in, in many ethical dilemmas, uh, which are very heavy, I think, psychologically today because we feel that we need to enter the relation, but at the same time, all of us at the end of the day need to be accountable as individuals. So perhaps, and, and I will conclude here because I also want to let some uh, room for um, talk and, and questions. But in my case, I mean, the, my uh, mission as part of that collective uh, and as a critical scholar is to show that firms and markets and only just one possible way to do things and to relativize uh, that form the economy has historically taken to show that our economies are much more than firms and markets are very heterogeneous and without the other organizational forms, without other activities happening outside firms and outside markets, nor mar neither markets nor firms could be there and to actually uh, promote an engagement of management scholars, juniors and seniors, not only with managers, but for ex with other stakeholders, including um, the state, including civil society, including trade unions, you know, the activism that Ozan has talked about, uh, you know, activism is one name for it, but engaging with a multiplicity of stakeholders which make up society and the economy. Um, so I would like to uh, stop here and I hope you have questions and I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mina. Thank you so much, Patricia. Great thanks and really, really so insightful. So, so putting everything together that Stella and Ozan have been also telling in such an aligned way, but also adding new dimensions to it for us to think about, to consider. And I can see it in the chat that our students have started putting great questions. Can I start with those, Patricia? Um, there is a question from uh, Eddie. Uh, the first question that I can see, but if I'm missing anyone, please do 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 warn me, colleagues. Uh, Eddie says, "I'm loving all the talks. Thank you, Eddie. So are we. All speakers are addressing how, as PhD researchers, we can critique social developments in my area, women's entrepreneurship. There are many great critical research, but very little has been implemented in policymaking. How this gap, critical research and policies, can be bridged? Policymaking point. Thank you, Patricia." This is a, a very, very important thing because um, um, <laughs> when, for example, when I write eh, and a journal asks me for policy impl implication, it's always a, a very difficult thing for, for a critical scholar. Why? Because policy is often a policy that disciplines in a certain way, right? Yeah. I, my, my way of engaging with policymaker is uh, less to present them with recipes to achieve their own goals and more to help them reflect. Uh, so to take a little bit a step back and to help um, them see parts of the story that they normally don't see so that when they develop themselves policy, they can take that kind of information with them, okay. you know? Uh, Policymakers often make the, the victims uh, actually of something responsible, right? And push <laughs> for taking up responsibility. So every time you enlarge their views on a phenomenon, you are helping them to deconstruct their own vision on it. 
So that has been my way to uh, kind of navigate the difficulty, you know, of the demand to develop policy make. Thank you so much, Patricia. Another question, uh, this is from Anna, Anna Sriskova. Um, thank you for a very inspirational speech. How realistic is it then to be uh, accepted for a publication for a critical viewpoint that is also not eager to optimize the profitability processes when you're a newly scholar, PhD student? Would the journals be interested? Uh, will be, or will be trusting you? I think it, you need to uh, really look at which journals you, you know, at the journals, there are quite a few journals. Somebody asked it before in the chat. There are quite a few journals that welcome research that of course needs to be relevant for organizations, right? That's the whole point. But it's not a micro-targeting profitability as the main goal. That's a little bit the, the difference, right? Which doesn't mean that you cannot learn something that can enhance profitability, <laughs> paradoxically enough. Um, I would say, you know, try to uh, explore the journals. Um, I would say there are a lot of, in general, quite a few European journals that are a bit more organization studies. And I'm thinking, you know, of the usual suspects are, you know, organization, organization studies, uh, human relations, um, gender work and organization, uh, management learning. I mean, there are quite a few uh, journals that are welcoming this kind of uh, research. But you, of course, the question is also in how far do you want to embrace this, right? So you have gotten here three speeches <laughs> from critical scholars who are very passionate about what we are doing. But it's not the, it, it, I, I think I can speak for all three of us. Our question is not that you do what we want to do, mm. but that you <laughs> find for yourself, you know, what do you want to do? But I think our speeches also point to you that you shouldn't be afraid. You shouldn't make that choice in order to conform before you have tried to, you know, to find out. I don't know if Ozan and Stella want to add something, but I think it's it's important to say this, right? We don't want you to make our choices. We want you to think and not to be afraid because in our cases, at least not being afraid has helped us instead of hampering us. Uh, I think Patricia has answered that well. I would just say I some, but you know, as challenging as my journey was, I did succeed in what I wanted to do. So, you know, and, and even if you go, let's put it this way, even if you go mainstream, those challenges are still there because of the nature of the academy, mm -hmm. you know? So, so it's not about avoiding any kind of challenges, it's about you really figuring out what, why am I doing this? What do I want to contribute? And, and that's kind of the way I put the emphasis on the I, because I think you have to do that. What I've learned in working with activist groups, <laughs> they will hold you accountable. Have you done your work? <laughs> have you done your work to think about why do I want to be part of this? And so, and, and, and so we're not saying, you know, you should model after my career or Patricia's career or Ozan. But I, I do think, yes, it, you need to think about it. Otherwise, remember the, the quote I ended with, by not making a choice, you have made a choice. I couldn't think of a better conclusion than this, Stella. I couldn't <laughs> think of a better way of endorsing all this, Ozan and Patricia. I am truly grateful to you all. And I'm so, 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 so thankful to you all for all this fascinating, really inspi inspirational, really thought-provoking talks. And as Patricia has said, these are some of the choices that we, we have made, some of our, us have made, and uh, some of us are making, in the making. So just to, just to inform you about these different paths and encourage you that it's a path worthwhile taking. Thank you everyone.